Hey, well, good morning, church family. How we doing? That's right, that's right. Go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be checking out verse 30. And while you're opening to Mark chapter 6, I'm just going to have to say, I did it again. And this is what I mean by that, okay? I was going to teach on a passage, but then I started studying. And so we're only going to do one verse today. And so basically, we're going to stay in the book of Mark until the rapture. So I hope you're okay with that, <laughs> because we've been in the book of Mark for like ever. And so it just, and we're barely in chapter 6. So I, it is what it is. Luckily, luckily, y'all love the word, so it doesn't. Doesn't matter, right? You, you don't mind if we go one verse at a time? I remember one time I gave a study on one word. One word one time. I just got stuck. It is what it is. I don't know. Pray for me. But Mark chapter 6, verse 30. Yeah, and this study is going to turn into a two or three part or two. So, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. We're not going to even finish the study. We're not even going to finish the study today, this morning. So, just a heads up, okay? But I'm going to have you open, and then we're going to, we're going to read it in a little bit. But let me, just, let me just say this. In preparing for this study, it reminded me of some of the things that I'm hearing that's happening with some churches, specifically Calvary chapels, where the senior pastor, who has been the pastor for many years, is getting up there in age and is realizing now that he can't retire because he never developed anyone to take over his church. And so for that senior pastor, he feels stuck. Then there's some other pastors who feel like they can't retire because if they do, they fear that their church, which they work so hard to develop and to maintain, will cease to exist. They fear that no one can do a good enough job, or at least a job like they themselves were able to do. And so they themselves are stuck as well. And one thing that Pastor Steve said to us was, this church, Calvary Chapel Rio Grande, is God's church. This is God's church. Yes, it's our church, but it's not my church. I've had people say that to me before. Hey, I can't wait to come visit your church. And in my mind, I'm like, uh, <laughs> not my church, our church, your church if you want. But it's definitely the Lord's church. And another thing that Pastor Steve would tell us is that all of us are replaceable because you never know what could happen. And so because all of us are replaceable, we should always be praying for and we should always be looking for and we should always be developing our replacement. And so that's what Pastor Steve did with me. And it's the reason why he is enjoying his retirement. And let me tell you something, people. He really is enjoying his retirement. Like, my goodness, that man is having the time of his life enjoying his retirement, going to and fro and here and there and loving life. And you know what? Praise the Lord, because after many years of faithful service, that's exactly what he gets to enjoy. He deserves it. And amen and amen. Make sure you guys keep him in prayer. Sometimes I have to tell him, hey, bro, you're retired. Kick back. What are you doing here? You don't work here anymore. Well, actually, he does work here. But I mean, you know. <laughs> don't make me take the key away from you, Pastor Steve. I will. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, you know, something that I had heard before. It's, it's a quote that I like. A quote that I want to share with you. And that is, faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you will never retire from serving God. And so even with Raleigh, you know, sharing a little bit about himself and sharing with us that on Cinco de Mayo, not only are the Mexicans going to be celebrating, but so is Raleigh. He's going to be celebrating as well because he gets to retire. So he's retiring from his career, just like Pastor Steve retired from his pastoral career. But a real servant of God never retires. And that's sort of where this study took me. This is what I want to explore. This is what I want to talk about. This is what we're going to unwrap today's study, maybe even next week's study. Who knows? But what I do know, what I do want to share with you is this. I want to make sure that you're not one that's thinking of retiring from serving the Lord. Because a true servant doesn't do that. So if that's you and you're just like, yeah, man, you know, I just... I can't get around like I used to. 
I can't do all of the things that I used to do. My body doesn't allow for me to do that, or time doesn't allow for me to do that. My family, you know, my responsibilities don't allow for me to do those things, and so I feel like I'm maybe worth less as a servant, as, whereas before, when I was serving God, just I felt like I was serving Him 24-7. I just felt like I was just so worthy. And maybe now you feel like you're worth less because your life has changed. And I'm trying to tell you this right now. That is not the case. Your life just changed. That's it. Maybe, maybe you don't have the same freedoms that you used to have before. Maybe you don't have the same physical capabilities that you used to have before. But what does that have to do with you stop being a servant of God? I know some servants, some faithful servants, who in times past were physically involved in everything and anything. They would go anywhere. They would do whatever, to the ends of the earth, start churches and so on and so forth, help church happen. Physically, now they can't do that. So you know what they're doing? They're mentally doing that. Well, how do you do that? This is how you mentally do that. You look for physical, able people, and you go, come here. Let me give you my mind so that you could physically do what I used to do when I was physically capable of doing that. And you know what they're doing? They're actually discipling. That ministry is absolutely important for a church to continue going forward. You know, some of us, yeah, okay, maybe we can't do the things that we used to do, but man, learn to switch. Learn to adapt. Be willing to accept the situation that you find yourself in. Never retire from serving the Lord. Let me say it like this. Don't you dare retire from serving the Lord. Because you will die. Spiritually speaking, it will affect you negatively. It will mess you up. It will make you vulnerable to the enemy, vulnerable to your flesh, vulnerable to things like depression, criticism, vulnerable to a lot of things that you shouldn't be vulnerable to. That God has given us the power and the ability to overcome Because we get to serve him. We get to serve him. Let me tell you something about serving. And we are going to read the verse. Don't worry. (laughs) Stay with me. The thing about serving God is that as we're washing people's feet, Jesus is washing our feet. As we're washing people's feet, as we're serving them, as we're sharing with them about the righteousness of God, God is sharing with us about his righteousness as well. Perhaps you have found yourself in this situation. You've experienced this where maybe you're ministering to someone, casual conversation or a full-blown counseling session, but you're conversing with them. And all of a sudden, you're just clicking spiritually. You're connecting. And you're saying the word of the Lord. You're sharing the gospel or you're, you're sharing a word of wisdom, word of knowledge. You're giving something to them that you know is of the Lord. And it's speaking directly into their heart. You could see it. You could... You can see how it's affecting them. They're they're listening. They're glued to every single word that you are saying. And you know that it's a divine appointment. You know that it's a spiritual thing. You know that God is in the midst of this conversation. And after that experience, after that conversation, how many of you have experienced leaving that and going, wow, I am ministered to? The things that I was saying, whoa, first of all, Right on, that was cool. But I find myself, as I'm ministering to people, I'm also ministering to myself. As I'm sharing with people about the righteousness of God, I'm reminding myself about the righteousness of God. As I'm sharing about the grace and the mercy and the love, I'm reminding myself of his love, grace, and mercy. See, when you're washing, when you're willing to serve people, when you're willing to wash people's feet, when you're willing to take them to Jesus and Jesus to them, I promise you, you're going to have some awesome residue, some divine residue. You're, you're, going to, you're going to leave that situation encouraged, on fire, revived, righteous, blessed. You're going to leave that experience changed as well. And if you stop doing those things, Man, I tell you, you, get, you miss out on that. Never 
retire from serving the Lord. And so the part that has really spoken to me that Pastor Steve was taught, you know, conveying to us and now I'm trying to convey to our team is that this church belongs to God. That even though it's our church, ultimately it's God's church. And the truth of the matter is this, God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. But he certainly invites us to be a part of his divine plan. Are you a part of his divine plan? Bible talks about Jesus being a co-worker or we being a co-worker with Jesus. Are you a co-worker of Jesus? I really hope that by the end of this study, you would leave either encouraged to continue being that co-worker or at least challenged to become and to remain a co-worker of Jesus Christ. So now, verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Done. That's all we're going to read today. Look at this. Here's the disciples gathering around Jesus, telling Jesus the things that they got to do and the things they got to preach, which is exactly what Jesus had done and exactly what Jesus was teaching. Co-workers. Do you see that? I love that. That's the part that really, really stood out to me. And so the last time we were in the book of Mark, we saw the end of John's ministry, John the Baptist. And as John's ministry was coming to an end, all of a sudden we're reading about a new ministry beginning to surface. See, back in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13, Jesus sent his disciples out to go and to preach about the coming of the kingdom of God to preach to the people that the Messiah had come and that his name is Jesus Christ. He sent them out to go and to preach that they needed to repent and that they needed to follow Jesus. Well, that's exactly what John the Baptist was doing. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Messiah. John the Baptist was telling the people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even pointed people to Jesus so that those people could follow Jesus. And he told them to repent, saying, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Well, what does that mean, to bear fruits worthy of repentance? Basically, it means this. Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and that you have turned to God. Hey, listen, that message right there, that, that what I just read, which John the Baptist was preaching some 2,000 years ago, is relevant to us today. That if we're born again believers, if we're Christians, prove it by the way you live. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and that you have turned to God. And let me add this, so help us God. Because we all have our moments and we all have our struggles but we continue going forward. We continue going forward and we keep getting up. If we fall, we keep getting up and we keep going forward. And the beautiful thing about that, about being a born again believer and this awesome privilege that we have, this connection that we have with our heavenly father, is that we can come to our heavenly father in Christ Jesus and confess our sins and Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And to cleanse us so that we don't continue living that way. Oh, how important it is that you have an active relationship with God. Not a knowledge, but an active relationship with God. On Wednesday night, this just came to me, on Wednesday night we were talking about this relationship that God the Father wants with us. You know that God the Father in His righteousness and in His divine ship, if I may, could have just said, listen, this is our relationship. Here are the parameters. I am the master, and you are the servants. You be good servants, and I will be a good master. And of course, when I said that, immediately I thought about Downton Abbey. Those of you guys that have watched Downton Abbey, 
I love that stuff. That stuff's good. I love English culture. For whatever reason, it just captivated my attention. And I'll tell you this right now. If I could live in that house, I'd be more than happy to be the gardener of that house. Hey, where do you live? <laughs> right there. I live there. That's my pad. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know the master's rolling to have that house. But because I'm a servant and because the master loves the way I do my work, he lets me stay in that mansion and I reap the benefits of living luxurious. I, I reap the benefits of, of these in, immense blessings that I would have never had hadn't I known the master, hadn't the master accepted me and allowed me to stay in, in his mansion. I am ultimately and completely blessed. And honestly, with God, if he would have just said to us, I'm the master and you are the servants, enter into my mansion and dwell, we would be, we would be good right there, right? Like, amen, yeah. Man, we're rolling now because we're rolling with the master. But that's not what God said. He didn't stop there. He took, it a next, he took it to the next level of intimacy. He said, no, 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 no. It's not master and servant. It's more, it's more father and children. Oh, that changes everything. See, a master can fire his servants. A father can never fire his kids. He can't. Because the connection. God could have Kept it master and servant. Hey, listen, we're going to keep it professional. Yes, there's going to be appreciation. Yes, there's going to be some love. But we're going to keep it professional. No, no, no. This is, this is the potential that we could have with our Heavenly Father. I will be your father, and you will be my children. And you parents and you grandparents know the power of the connection that you have with your children and your grandchildren. You would be willing to die for them. You would go wherever they go in terms of, and I've, you know, again, I've shared this before and keep saying it over and over again, especially because my kids are here, so they need to hear this. No matter what, my kids know that I love them to the death. Whether they disappoint me or make me absolutely proud, I'm still going to be there for them. I'm going to be there. If, they're, if they own mansions, I'm going to be living in those mansions. <laughs> I, I promise you, I'm going to be there with you, baby. I'll drive your cars and I'll, your yacht. And I'll garden your, your mansion. I promise you, I will be there. I'll take the money to the bank. But I also will be there if you go to prison for the rest of your life. And I will visit you for the rest of your life. And I will love you just the same. Because I'm your father and you're my child. And now never change. It's the incredible thing about God and his grace and his mercy. And it's that kindness that if you let it really, really minister to you, will lead you to repentance it leads you to repentance. And then you will serve the Lord. And, and it's not even about retiring. It's just I ju you just naturally serve the Lord. Hmm. In reading all of this, in seeing the end of John the Baptist ministry, and then seeing the beginning of the ministry of the disciples, of course, this is not a coincidence. This is God's providence. Of course, God knew that John's ministry was coming to an end. In fact, it was his will to let John's ministry come to an end. And yet God had already chosen through Christ Jesus who would take over the ministry. And so God in his providence, through his son Jesus, appointed these disciples to continue the same ministry that John the Baptist was doing. Of course, this reminds me of Elijah. The story of him in 1 Kings 19 after he ran away from Queen Jezebel who had ordered his ex execution. And so here's Elijah hiding out in some cave out in the wilderness, absolutely and completely discouraged. And so then he says to the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. It's almost like Elijah's like, God, listen, maybe you don't know what's going on, but this is what's going on. It's almost like 
He's making a declaration to God. I and I alone have been the only one zealous for you. All of the children of Israel have forsaken you, torn down your altars, and have even killed your prophets. And I'm the only one that remains. And look, now they're after me. What are you going to do about this, God? And I think that Elijah was basically saying, Lord, can you please spare my life? Have you ever felt like you were the only one zealous for the things of God and that the people around you just didn't have it like the way you have it? The reason why I'm asking that is because I've been there. When I was in the rehab home, man, I was, again, my nickname was Theologian. And the reason why my nickname was Theologian, and the reason why I say it like that, Theologian, was because I was deep into the word of Jesus. Constantly in the word all the time. Whenever someone would come up to me, give them a verse. When someone needed something, here's a verse. Here's a Bible study. Quick, five-minute Bible study. And, and I would just have all these answers because I was in the Word all of the time. And I remember getting so, so on fire for Jesus that I began to look at my other brothers that were at the rehab home and just being sorely disappointed. <laughs> I was just like sad for them, weeping over their soul. And I remember just praying one time, fully in the spirit, almost to the third heaven, <laughs> going, Lord, these men, change them like the way you're changing me. Make them on fire like the way you've made me on fire. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Because in order to be a servant of God, you have to be humble. I thought I was being humble. I was really being zealous. And that zealousy, if I may, that zealousy, <laughs> come on, that's a good one. It should be a word. That zealousy was killing me. I just didn't know it. But they did. I was blind. And here I am thinking I'm a servant, and I wasn't. I wasn't a servant at all. And so here's Elijah saying, I'm the only one. Spare me. So here's the Lord's response to Elijah. And before I share with you exactly what he said to Elijah, it simply confirms what God had said before in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9, where God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so this is the way the Lord answers Elijah. He says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And then he goes on and he says to him, anoint Elijah. Elisha, you shall anoint him as prophet in your place. And then he says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. Now, if I was Elijah and God told me that, I would have been like, wait, what? I thought I was the only one. God's like, no. First of all, I already have your replacement in place. <laughs> so what does that mean for me? Yeah, you'll find out. Hint, hint, chariot of fire. Anyways, <laughs> rapture. Anyways, but I already have your replacement. Well, how long have you been working on this replacement for? My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It didn't even cross your mind that I have everything under control, and so here I am confirming to you I have everything under control. Elijah, I got it. I am the Lord God. Oh, and by the way, you're not the only one. There's at least 7,000 men who have not bowed their knees to Baal. Not to mention the women and their children. So we're talking about potentially thousands and thousands that are still worshiping me. And I had everything to do with that, Elijah. 
Because my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Let me tell you something. When it comes to this church, brothers and sisters, God is in control, and he's way ahead of us. He just is. As a matter of fact, when it comes to your life, God is ahead of you. He's already made plans. Right? Jeremiah 29, 11. He's already made plans. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I have prepared works beforehand so that you may walk in them. He's ahead of us. And that's something that you can rely upon. That's something that you can base your trust upon, especially when it comes to your kids and your grandkids. God has it under control. And no matter what, God is good no matter what. And when it comes to his judgments, when it comes to who's going to go to heaven and who's not going to go to heaven, no matter what, his righteous, his, his judgments are righteous and they're true. So that none of us can say, oh God, that was unfair. No. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. True and righteous are all his judgments. No matter what. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen to my kids or my grandkids or the people that I've been ministering to that I love so much, who I care for so much. But I'm afraid that if you remove me, if something happens to me, how are they going to make it without me? And the Lord says, well, they're, they're mine first. I created them and blessed you and, and being able to experience this with me. But I'm ahead of the program already. I'm steps ahead of you. And I told you this a couple of weeks ago, how God, when he talks to us, basically almost converses with us as if we're already there with him face to face for eternity. That's the way God sees things. Like he, he's already in eternity forever. <laughs> and we get stuck here with right now and what we have to face, deal with on a regular basis. And yet God sees us already there with them in heaven forever. Maybe if we were to view ourselves like the way God views us, maybe we wouldn't worry so much. Maybe we wouldn't be so anxious and so fearful and feeling like, man, if, if I die, if something happens to me, my family's just going to fall apart. Really? Let me ask you this. Do you really think that God needs you? Is he not able to fulfill his will without you? Because I'm trying to tell you that he can and he will. He will. And some of you have this anxiety, this fear, like, man, I've got to stay, I've got to stay, and I can't, nothing can happen to me. Because if I, man, it, it's all dependent on me. I'm holding the house together. I'm holding the church together. No, God is holding it together. And you need God to hold you together lest you fall apart. And the only way you can do that is if you know that God's in control if you know that he absolutely loves you and all that he has in mind for you in Christ Jesus is nothing but the best. Jesus even said the word perfect. Perfect. That God has nothing but perfect things in store for you. Exactly what you need. And so in 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah's ministry coming to an end, but God already chosen the next person to continue the ministry. And just like Elijah was feeling hopeless and isolated, God reveals to him how he had already taken care of everything. Why? Because God is in control. And again, when it comes to this church, God is in control. Not the pastors, not me, not the elders, not the leaders, not the veterans either, or the new people. God is in control. This is his church. And we get to rest in that. We get to relax in that. We get to enjoy that. We get to embrace that. There's freedom in that. But you have to trust and you have to believe. You have to believe that God, God is just bigger than us, more powerful than us, that his ways and his thoughts are over our ways and our thoughts. And so, like I said before, God doesn't need any humans to do his work. Like in the Old Testament, he could just send angels to do his will. And even in the New Testament, God could just send his angels. And when God sends his angels, boy, let me tell you something. Their track record is amazing. Angels don't mess around. 
And I haven't seen anywhere in the Bible where they've messed up, except for the fallen angels. That was different. That was rebellion. But when it comes to doing God's will, they're on point. They don't mess around. In the Bible, it talks about how there have been times, perhaps, that we have entertained angels who were in undercover humans. God could just do that. He doesn't need any of us. How cool would it be if the pastor of this church was an angel? <laughs> That'd be impressive. That would be amazing. I'd be a little jealous, but whatever, or zealous, but whatever. <laughs> but when it comes to humans, well, that's a whole different story now, right? I mean, every single human that God has used and continues to use is flawed. Hey, newsflash, I'm flawed. Just so that you know, I'm flawed. I am. That's just all there's to it. And so are you. And I mean that lovingly and respectfully and humbly. But truthfully, we're all flawed. And even when you look in the Bible and you read about the greats, they're flawed. They were flawed. Just in the Old Testament, Abraham, the forefather of faith, right? Lied. Which led other men to walk off with his wife on two different occasions. Wow. Do you imagine his wife talking to the kids? Hey, did dad ever tell you about that one time where he lied and uh, another guy took me? Not once, but twice. Over the day. I'm just imagining. Let's talk about some things that have happened in your marriage, Abraham. If you want to read more about that, check it out in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20. Goodness, Abraham, really? You let, you let different men just walk off with your wife? Uh, yeah, I was afraid. What? Oh, man. And then Jacob, bless his heart, pretty much a pathological deceiver. You want to read more about that? Genesis 25, Genesis 27, Genesis 30. A pathological deceiver. Man, he was a pathological liar. You know, anyone like that? Do you know anyone that's a pathological liar? Here, let me twist your noodle real quick on this. If God gets a hold of that pathological liar, he can be used just as powerfully as God used Jacob. That's crazy, isn't it? Because some of us were pathological deceivers and liars, and yet God is using us now. Hmm. Don't forget where you came from. Sometimes we forget where we come from, and we look down on people, not realizing that some of us were worse than they were, or exactly the same, and we despise their sin, but yet we receive all the grace for our sin. That's a double standard. Be careful with that. Be very, very careful with that. That'll make you more judgmental than loving. Let's look at Moses, by far, arguably, the greatest Israelite to have ever walked this planet simply because to him was given the commandments of God. To him was given the law of God. Because Moses got to see the back of God's body, I guess you could say. And the Bible says that Moses was the most humblest man on the face of the earth. But man, did he have some serious problems with this temper. Oh, but he was so humble. But he also killed a man. But he's so humble. Man. Exodus chapter 2. And then he lost it again. Exodus 32. And then he really lost it. Numbers 20. Flawed. Oh, let's talk about his partner in crime, Brother Aaron. As Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments, here's Aaron, the forefather of all of the priests who would lead worship of Elohim, Jehovah, of God. What does the forefather of these priests do? Aaron, he forms an idol for the people to worship, to commit all kinds of immorality. Exodus 32. Man, Aaron, you blew it. Flawed. Of course, King David. The Bible says a man after God's own heart, and yet he concealed his adultery with a murder. 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's incredible. Some of the things that these men, these great men did. Listen, I know we've all sinned, and maybe some of you have committed some of these things, 
But I'm sure most of us have not committed a lot of these things. And yet you feel that God can't use you. Because the whole point behind this Bible study is this. You feel that you're not worthy to be used by God. And I have a problem with that. That is a lie from the devil. The truth of the matter is, no matter how good you are, you're never going to be worthy to be a servant of God. So you might as well just serve God. You might as well just serve God. The work that you do, the service that you do unto the Lord is equivalent to the service that any leader with the title does, pastor, elder, deacon, whatever. Sometimes people, oh yeah, but George, your work is special. It's divine. It's anointed. You and the Lord face to face. I'm like, but so is your ministry. So is your service. So is the things you do. Do you really think that God (laughs) comes into my office and gives me the Bible study? Hey, here you go. Here's your notes. Thank you, God. He just doesn't. He doesn't do that. It doesn't work that way. But let me tell you what the Lord knows about me. I am willing to serve him. Anytime, every time. Whether I'm rocking it for him and the times when I'm not, I'm still willing to to serve him. And he continues to employ me. He continues to use me. Sometimes I'm like, why? Lord, I'm flawed. Why? (laughs) Because my grace is sufficient. Because I know your heart. Because I'm not looking for a perfect heart. I'm looking for a willing heart. And you're willing. Are you willing? You willing to be used by God or, or, or what are you doing? What, what are you doing in terms of serving the Lord? Tell me you're doing something. And if you tell me you're doing something, I'm going to tell you this. What you're doing for the Lord is equivalent to that which Billy Graham was doing, Paul the Apostle was doing, Elijah, Elijah, the greats in the Bible. Your ministry, your service is equivalent to them. Just as valuable, just as important just as necessary. Listen, I used to be a detailer, auto detailer. There's a big difference between washing your car and detailing your car. Big difference. As a pastor, you know what I do? I wash the cars. That's what I do. I give a general study to all of you. I wash the cars. You know what you get to do? You get to detail the car. Because as I'm talking to all of you, there's probably like, what, 5,000 people in here today? Maybe six, 6,000 people, right? So as I'm talking to 6,000 people here right now, and plus the 24,000 that are online right now, watching this happen, I'm just washing cars. But you get to get into the details as you connect with that one person. And you get to know them, and they get to know you. you. We're getting into the details now. As you invite them over to your house, and they invite you over to your house, and you guys are getting to know each other, each other's family, you guys get into the details as you start talking about things, personal things, testimonial things, hopes, dreams, fears, all of that. You start talking the details. See, I give you the general. You guys get to do the details. And to me, that is more important You know what makes a car look brand new is the details. You know what keeps a church fresh looking brand spanking new? The details. It's not just me preaching. It has to be you getting involved with one another. It has to be you willing to get into the details with each other's lives. You guys have to connect with each other. Some of you guys are isolating yourselves too much. I would encourage you to open up a little bit. Help church Happen. That was our hashtag a couple years ago, making church happen, hashtag. And what we would do is we would walk around and we would see someone doing something, take a picture, making church happen, hashtag. Anything you do is making church happen, whether it be here at the church or outside of the church. My point is, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. And because you do it unto the Lord, it's equivalent to any other service that was done on to the Lord. 
And when we read about these flawed brothers and sisters in the Bible, God still used them to fulfill his will. And if you feel that you're too flawed, understand that God is still willing to use you. The question is, are you willing? That, that's really it. Are you willing? And if you're willing, God is going to use you. And if you're not willing, you're going to miss out on one of the most beautiful things that we Christians get to experience in Christ Jesus. These people that I just read to you about, they messed up, but God forgave them. And at this very moment are in heaven with our heavenly Father. That's what fascinates me about the grace of God. And yet I have Christians still coming up to me saying, yeah, well, I still got to work on myself before I could, you know, really be used by God. Well, I'm just not good enough to be used by God. And yet look at what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And then a couple of verses later, he says this, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's a perfect combination. Realization. I am blessed by his grace to have been counted worthy to save him knowing this, that I am the chief sinner. Man, that's receiving God's grace. That's the grace that leads to repentance, the kindness that leads to repentance. That's the attitude of gratitude that motivates us to want to serve the Lord because he's just so good to us. Let me close with this. If you feel that you're flawed or maybe you've been sinning, you've been compromising lately, one way that can help you get out of that is by you serving the Lord. Now, I'm going to share with you a raw little story, okay? So bear with me. When I was about 15 years old, that's when I started doing math. And every single time I would do math, I would start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to my homies. Every single time. Let's talk about God. All right. You're going to hell, you know that? If you don't give your life to Jesus, you're going to hell. You know that, right? That's what I would start doing. I would start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And so then I remember the very last time I did math. I was almost 18 years old. And we had just finished. And all of a sudden, I just had this thought come to me, this feeling, this sensation come over me. And I'm just like, I'm looking at my homies, and I'm like, hey, man, i got to tell you guys something real quick. And they're like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, hey, check it out. One of these days, one of these days, you're never going to see me again. And the next time you do see me, I'm going to be a totally different person. You're going to see me being a full-blown believer in Christ Jesus. And that was all I said. We, we were high. And they were just like, all right, homie, yeah, whatever, done. Tweaked out for the rest of the night. And sure enough, the next day, I got arrested, and that led me to the rehab home where I ended up becoming a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sure enough, the next time I saw the homies that I was talking to, sure enough, it was right after I graduated the men's home, and they're like, wow, you different. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is Jesus in me. I'm in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I didn't, I wasn't prophesying. It just happened. Because what... Because I'm telling you, God has plans, and he's in control. So if you are struggling with sin, you've been sinning, try doing what I did. Preach the gospel, see what happens. <laughs> Start serving God, see what happens. I know sometimes we're like, no, 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 you got you to be qualified to serve God. Well, okay, I get it. You could think that. But I wasn't when I started serving God, so, and I still am not. So I don't know what to tell you. I just see it differently. But I know this, that being disqualified or unqualified really to serve God has brought me to where I'm at right now. I know that. That I do know. That's my experience. It's my testimony. 
And next week, we're going to talk about the disciples and how flawed they were and how so unqualified and how so not ready they were, just like some of you. When you first gave your life to Jesus at the revival that was happening in Southern California, and all of a sudden, you're a pastor. All of a sudden, you're an elder. You're a deacon, evangelist. All of a sudden, two weeks later, boom, you got your own church. Why is it any different now? Why should it be any different now? Is God not the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be forever? Just saying, something to think about. So, Father, we come before you, and we praise you for your grace and for your mercy, that your ways are much higher than our ways. Your thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. Lord, you're already in future eternity. Lord, you're, there's just no time with you. You're not bound by time like we are. You dwell in the realm of eternity. You've already taken care of everything. The, the Bible has been written. It is finished. The book of Revelation has been written. It has been prophesied. It will be fulfilled. Lord, in your eyes, we're there with you already. You've already made plans, and you're going to fulfill those plans. Father, I just pray that we would take great comfort in that. You're in control, not us. You don't need us, and yet you employ us. Thank you for that. And as we're praying, for those of you that are serving already, I'm asking for God to baptize you afresh with the power of his Holy Spirit that you may continue running and swinging till the rapture come or you take your last breath. Never retire. Don't you dare retire. Don't you dare retire from serving him. Keep going forward. Now, the rest of you, perhaps maybe you haven't been serving. You're not serving at all. I want to ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Holy Spirit, will you please come upon these brothers, these sisters. Anoint them like the way you anointed the disciples in Acts chapter 2 and fill them with that dynamite power that they may be your witnesses to the death if necessary. Give them that oomph that Spurgeon speaks of, that Ravenhill speaks of, that oomph from the Spirit, that power, that motivational force to simply serve whatever capacity. Come upon them, I pray, the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand for this last song, please.